Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with Developer University. For more of my training videos for beginners, please visit me at devu.com. Previously in this course, I said that the .NET Framework class library is merely a collection of classes, each containing methods filled with functionality that we can utilize in our applications, but we didn't have to write. Microsoft has spent tens of thousands of man hours building and maintaining this library of code and we can benefit from it by merely calling into its classes and methods inside of our applications. Now the framework class library is massive. Thousands of classes each with their own set of methods. And so the developers of the framework class library wisely decided to split this library of code up into multiple files. Just imagine if you had to load the entire library into memory every time you wanted to run your application. Uh, first of all, it would be excruciatingly slow, and then secondly, it would probably take up the majority of your computer's memory. And so they split up the code into multiple files. These code files are called .NET assemblies. In fact, even the applications that we build, they're ultimately compiling into .NET assemblies. As you can see, I have a new project called Assemblies and Namespaces already open. I've added two lines of code. If you want to pause the video and catch up, that would be great. Uh, in lines 13 and 14, I'm merely printing hello world to the screen and then pausing the execution of the application. Uh, however, even in this application, a executable .NET assembly is being generated the very first time that we run the application while we're debugging. So now, if you want to take a look at what happens, go to your projects directory and inside of the project folder, you'll see that there's a bin directory. We avoided this very early in this course, but now I want to talk about it briefly. The bin directory will contain both a debug and a release version, ultimately a release version. The debug version will contain additional files required by Visual Studio to connect to the execution of the, uh, of the, the compiled executable. This allows us to step through the execution and pause the execution line by line in the Visual Studio debugger. Now we can additionally then, after we created our application and thoroughly debugged it, we can say, I want to create a release version of the application, then go to Build Solution in the Build menu, and it will create a version of our application without any of those debugging symbols, without that connection to the debugger. If you look at the file system, uh, you might be a little confused to see that it also has a lot of those extra files in there, but they're, they're basically ignored. But that uh, is what's going on behind the scenes. Notice that in each of these cases, we're building an executable file that will run, and we could even just double-click it and run the application from here, like we did before, right? Uh, now that is different from the type of .NET assembly that allows you to create a library of code that can be shared across multiple projects. In that case, you'd be compiling a project into a .dll um, file extension. And we can create a code library. I'll show you how to do that in another video. Uh, but at any rate, the .NET framework has to already be installed on any computer where you want your application to work or to run. Fortunately, uh, basically every copy of Windows already has the .NET Framework runtime and the class libraries installed in a location that's globally accessible called a, the Global Assembly Cache. And so every .NET application can reference the same set of assemblies in that one spot on your hard drive. Uh, now, you might say that whenever you built your application and set up uh, your application, you may not realize that by choosing to create a file new project and then selecting the console uh, window 
project template, you were actually creating references to those files in the .NET Framework class library. Uh, that's one of the functions of the setup routine for a, uh, for a project template. So if you take a look at the references node underneath your project in the Solution Explorer over here on the right hand side, you'll see that there are some references already to uh, these, these, uh, these things like system, system.core, system.data, system.net, and so on. All right. Now, We'll talk about what these are in just a moment, but that's indicative of the fact that we have references into uh, files of the .NET Framework class library that the creator of the console window application thought we might be or might find useful at some point. All right, so we'll come back to that in just a moment. Now, sometimes you'll need an assembly from the .NET Framework class library that has not been referenced and I'll demonstrate how to do that in an upcoming lesson or perhaps you need to add a reference to an assembly created by a third party maybe even yourself I'll, again I'll demonstrate not only how to create your own class library but then also how to create references to third party assemblies as well Again, there are th tens of thousands of classes defined in the full .NET Framework class library. In a few cases, the same class name was used, or at least there was the potential for it to be used. And so when that happened, the creators needed a way to be able to tell one class from a different class. And so they introduced the notion of namespaces. And namespaces are like last names for your classes. So think about your name or my name, for example. Uh, somebody might say Bob loves coffee, and you might say, well, which Bob? There's like a billion Bobs in the world, right? But if somebody were to say Robert Theron Tabor likes coffee, well, that narrows it down. I'm pretty sure that I'm the only person in the world that has that, that combination of first, middle, and last name, all right? So I could either use the full name Robert Theron Tabor to reference one person or once we understand the context of who we're talking about maybe we're talking about only people in this room uh, then you might say well Bob likes coffee he's the only Bob in this room so they must be talking about Bob right so the same idea works with your code we could use the full name of the classes that we need inside of our application so for example the full name of the console class is actually system.console.writeline all right, or uh, the system.console class, right? That's the full name of the class, and then we're calling the method in that class. However, you'll notice that I didn't have to use the word system here. Why not? Well, because we used a using statement at the very outset of this code file, which says, I want you to look inside of these namespaces whenever you find a class reference that you don't recognize. And so the, the C-sharp compiler, it finds the word console and it says, hmm, I wonder where that came from. And it begins to look through the namespaces listed in the code file and it says, oh yeah, I found a class name called console inside of a namespace called system. All right, and so it thinks, all right, well that must be the console class that he's talking about. Now occasionally you might have two classes with the same name and you've added using statements for each of these inside of your code file. When that happens you merely need to disambiguate by adding the full name of the class uh, instead of relying simply on the using statement. Now you'll notice here that by default the program.cs file has a number of different using statements. In my text editor they're kind of faded out a little bit which indicates to me that they're not being utilized at this moment. So we could remove unused using statements from our code and our code will compile just fine. Again, this is a convenience for us that was uh, set up for us by whoever created the project template for a console window application. So to further illustrate this idea, let's talk about how we can go about using the .NET Framework class library to do meaningful things and uh, how we would go about finding the source code or the classes we need to do something cool in our application. So for example, maybe I want to write uh, data to a text file. How could I go about doing that? Well, I might open up 
bing.com and I might search for and I'm going to type in site microsoft.com so I'm going to limit the search results to just those that are returned by microsoft.com all right this is going to going to help me find the documentation specifically created by microsoft as opposed to third party articles or whatever the case might be so site colon microsoft.com and then I might just say write to a text file and then using C sharp right and so one of the top results are from msdn.microsoft.com and MSDN stands for the Microsoft Developer Network this is your primary source of information as a software developer on the Microsoft uh, on the Microsoft platform and so in this case here's a how-to article that will describe the code that we would need to write in order to write data to a file, here's a long code example. In fact, it gives us three examples in one. And we could use one of these examples in our application in order to, in order to uh, write, file, write data to a file. And we might decide to go ahead and use this second example. It comes close to what we want to, to work with here. And I copy it and paste it into my application. And I might remove some of the extra, some of the extra information here, just because I don't need it. And I may need to modify this path. Uh, I believe I created a folder called Lesson 17 uh, for this purpose. And notice that it's going to use a class name file and a method called Write All Text. Now, in this particular case, notice that. Uh, we already are given the full name, the full namespace of, of this file class, system.io.file. Now, what we could do is actually remove that from here and go up and add a using statement for system.io, like so. All right, and notice that the compiler will find it and we'll be able to run our application And uh, got a little message there because I was in release mode. Let's go back to debug and start that over again. All right, and we don't get any feedback there, but if we were to open up our uh, Lesson 17 folder, we would be able to find the text in, uh, in a text file. Great. Okay, so now we can use that little snippet of code to do what we want to do. But notice it all started by searching on MSDN, finding... Uh, a code snippet that we could use and then we can modify it and add our own text here uh, that we want to then we want to write this to our file right okay so that we start stitching things together so that's one thing that we can one way that we can find the features inside of the dotnet framework class library that we need is to search on msdn let's try one more quick example and uh, let's go back here, back to bing.com. And here again, I want to go site colon uh, microsoft.com. And then I want to do uh, C sharp download HTML as a string. And I might find another, uh, another reference. Now, this is a different style of web page. There is one web page on MSDN for every class and every method in the .NET Framework class library. So in this case, we're looking at a specific page for this download string method. And if you were to look at the remarks and, and some of the additional, the syntax and some of the exceptions that it would throw, what we ultimately get to is a little, uh, is a little snippet of code that we can copy and that we can paste inside of our application. Now notice what happens this time. Uh, it does not recognize the term web client. Why not? Well, we may not have the assembly referenced in our project or we may have the assembly referenced but we do not have a using statement that would include the web client class. So to remedy this, I'm going to hit control period on my keyboard, and it says that it found this class in system.net. So we can automatically add a using statement 
uh, for the system.net class by merely hitting the enter key on my keyboard or I can just go ahead and say let's go ahead and use the full name of the class here I'll choose the first option using the arrow keys and then the enter key on my keyboard Notice what happens, it adds a using statement for system.net and then notice that the web client class is now found. It is obviously um, uh, in a different color. There's no red squiggly line so it looks like it found the correct class that we're looking for. Now we merely need to give it uh, a URL so let's try um, msdn.microsoft.com like so and then we will just write this out to screen reply and then we might even rework our application and attempt to save that into our text file as well So let's see what we get here. Hopefully this will work. We'll run the application. All right, it took a moment, but it loaded up a bunch of HTML into our console window. We can see the closing body and the closing HTML tag. Now if we were to go back to our folder and find our Lesson 17 folder, and open up our text file, we see here is the full web page that we scraped off of msdn.microsoft.com. Okay, So uh, that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to say in this lesson. We are able to utilize the classes and methods in the .NET Framework class library and we can find what we need by doing simple searches in bing.com using site colon microsoft.com to find the classes and the methods that we want to work with. Once we find those classes that we want to work with and we find maybe even little code snippets, we can copy those into our program and we may need to at that point fix the references to those classes. Now in this first case, remember that it gave us the full name of our file class, system.io.file, but in the second case we had to provide uh, the using statement system.net in order for the compiler to find the class that we were wanting to reference and work with. And ultimately we did that with hitting control period on the keyboard to add a using statement to the very top of our code. We talked about the purpose of namespaces to provide disambiguity between class names. We talked about the using statement as a way of creating a shortcut or a context and say we're not talking about every class uh, in the .NET Framework class library. We're only talking about these, the classes that happen to be in these namespaces. So if you find Mr. C Sharp compiler, if you find a class that you don't recognize, look in those namespaces first before you complain. Okay? So uh, we're going to continue on these ideas in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you.